So Jason, you were attached to this even before John, and I mean, I just, I have to say, like, you are not the first person I think people would think of when well, I wasn't the first Kennedy. person they thought of. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you're so fantastic. Did you, did you ever wonder if you could pull it off? Uh, you, you always wonder that with an actor. I mean, you know, I, I wonder that with any role that I'm doing, whether I can pull it off, particularly somebody, you know, who, who still has family alive, someone is, you know, is, who has left such a, a mark on, on, you know, Massachusetts and America and the world, you know, and is so well known, absolutely, I was terrified. So what did compel you to want to do the movie? I felt a real need to tell this story. When I read it, I read it on a plane, and I was, uh, I was on this plane for 14 hours, and, and I think I read it twice, and I've never done that before in my life. I, I put it down, and I turned to my wife, and I just said, I think I've read something extraordinary, although I still can't work out how I feel. You know, it, it, leaves, it left me feeling something very, very strongly. And, um, and then I read it again before we landed, and, and at that point I thought, you know what, I really want to make this happen. And, uh, and that never left. How did this story find its way to you, and what compelled you to want to tell it? Um, I got a call from Rob Stein, who's Jason's manager, and um, he said, I read a great script, I want you to read it, Jason's going to do it, and that intrigued me. And then he told me he was on Chappaquiddick, and I was, you know, very worried, because I thought it's either going to be like a hit piece or, you know, an apologist or something like that, and... Um, and I got the script, and it was just an amazing script. It, you know, it, it was um, everything that I kind of hoped it would be, you know, a, a, a portrait of a paradox. And um, I wanted to work with Jason for a really long time. You mentioned, you know, you, when you first heard what the title of the movie was or what it was about, you sort of had these preconceived notions or fears, maybe, that it would be a hit piece or, you know, just fall into a, a category that didn't interest you. Um, did you guys come to this project with preconceived ideas about Ted Kennedy or, or the Kennedy family, and did you find that this project changed them? Well, I mean, I am I was nine when this happened, and I was living in New Jersey um, in the town next to the Kopechnys. So I, I remember it vaguely, you know, the rumors and stuff like that. And I thought I knew the story, but then reading the script, I, I, I was like... I mean, I found myself disturbed and then laughing and then disturbed that I was laughing and, you know, had all these very weird feelings reading it. And it was such a... And I, my experience reading it, at, when I finished it, I thought, you know, if I could make the film in some way where that was your experience seeing it, that seemed like a great challenge to me. But, you know, I mean, I'm a Ted Kennedy fan in terms of what he championed. I mean, I didn't know Ted Kennedy and, you know, I, I know all the rumors and the innuendos and, you know, I don't... You know, I'm sure a lot of it's true, um, but you know, I guess I I believe in what he believed in. You know, I can't say anything more about him as a person because I never I didn't know him, but I don't know anyone that knew him. But um, you know, I, in terms of having preconceived ideas about Chappaquiddick, um, the stuff that I thought was preposterous in the script when I sat down with the writers because I hadn't really done a lot of research yet. Um, I had about a dozen questions of things I just thought were writer inventions. And <laughs> all of them were, were drawn from the inquest and they're all facts, at least in terms of the way that Ted laid them out, you know. So some of the strangest stuff in the film, you know, are the, are the most factual. What about you? I mean, um, you, you're familiar enough with America to probably know how important the Kennedys are, but this probably didn't, you didn't grow up with this story, I'm presuming. No, I was actually born the day they took off for the moon, yeah. Which is funny because I'm actually doing an astronaut film now, First Man with Damien Chazelle. <laughs> and I was just at NASA. But, you know, I learned an immense amount from this story. You know, I did a series called Brotherhood on Showtime, which was set in Rhode Island. Ooh. And I met Ted very quickly one day. But, you know... Wait, as sorry, an, even you met as Ted Kennedy? Very quickly, yeah, yeah, at a, at a boat race, the Fagawi boat race, which is off of Hyannisport. And what he did you think? He, you know, he had a beautiful boat. <laughs> <laughs> It was a magnificent sailing yacht, and it's the kickoff to the. Uh, I mean, you know, he's Ted Kennedy, you know, and, uh, and so of course I'm very aware of who he is, and 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 his position and his stature and status and the moments in history that he's been. I mean, Ted was baptized by the Pope, you know. I, I learned a huge amount in this film, you know, and uh, you, whenever you go down the rabbit hole, you start with you know with Joe Kennedy, and then and, and that man's f f footprint is a footprint on America and the world of the of the 20th century. And it's a massive footprint, and Ted, 
is a large part of that. And, uh, and I was just stuck by how much I didn't know about Chappaquiddick, what he'd actually done, and how I felt now about other people I believed in and other things that I hadn't bothered to find out about or go down the rabbit hole about. And, um, you know, I think you can only learn about where you are and where you might possibly want to go by studying history. And, um, you know, I thought the script did a great job of reporting the facts. And then John did a fantastic job of really steering it strongly. You know, this is a serious film, even though it's light and it's at, at times and it's absurd at times. And, but it's a, it's a serious piece in the fact that, you know, we, we did want to share exactly what you're asking. What did we learn? What have we learned? How do we feel about what we've learned? And, um, and that's, why I, you know, that's why I had this need you know, to, f to make this movie, to be in this movie, and, and, and to be here tonight. You know, you mentioned thinking you know, parts of it must have been writer creations. Um, is it true? I heard that the writers took everything from the actual inquest. Like they weren't going to include anything that didn't happen in the inquest. And um, I mean, that was their Bible, you know. The it, I, they drew from the inquest and from his statement, his statements and his speech. Um, in terms of, I, I think the, um, the the major plot points and, and the decisions and the characters. Um, I mean, obviously they invented dialogue and you know we condensed number of characters and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, some of the stranger stuff. You know, the deputy that that was the only witness to the car at night. I mean that. That's verbatim the way it went down, you know. And um, I mean, and the weirdest thing is uh, when we were shooting, we shot on Chappaquiddick for a couple of days, and um, a woman came up to me and said, um, "Oh, you doing the film on Chappaquiddick? I, my father was the chief. Her father was Chief what? Arena. Was chief Arena and she gave, and she got very excited, and she gave me his number, and I called him, and and I talked to him at length, and he's he's very old now." And I think his memory's gone a little bit. I think he just sort of, he wasn't very illuminating. He sort of repeated sort of a lot of the old tropes that mm -hmm. now we've come to, you know, accept as facts. But I think that it's, you know, who knows. But, um, yeah, it, it, was, um, it was, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, how factually accurate it was. They got everything from yeah, the Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, a, it's an impression of... of a fable of the facts. I mean, who, we don't, I have no idea what happened that night. And I've done a lot of reading and research. We all have our own ideas about what went down. I don't think it's that complicated. I think some, they were drinking and there was an accident and bad decisions were made. I don't think it was, you know, I don't think there's that much of a mystery, but um, and there's a lot of crazy rumors about what went down that night. Um, so, you know, who knows? I mean, it wasn't really my idea to kind of, this is the, you know, going to blow the lid off the truth, and this is the factual telling of this story, you know. Um, that wasn't what we set out to do. But in some ways, I mean, it actually could have been more salacious. Like, I, I'm embarrassed to admit that when I, the only thing I knew about Mary Jo were, were things that might not even be true. Um, and I really appreciated that this presented, like, a fully-fledged, kind of really an amazing woman. You know, yeah, who was. who had such a bright future. and Yeah, they weren't, I mean, they've always been talked about as... Um, you know, secretaries. I mean, they were mm -hmm. an integral part of of Bobby's um, campaign, and um, all very strong, highly educated, independent women, ambitious. All of them went on to do amazing things. You know, a, a number of them are still alive. And really um, believed in Bobby and what he was about. Absolutely. You know, and this was a, the second year that they were having sort of reunion. You know, after Bobby's death, to kind of you know all, you know, it was important to Teddy to kind of keep keep the spirits up and keep that, that network of people together. Um, I think a large part of, of you know, uh, uh, relating so much to Mary Jo is you have cast Kate Mara, who is fantastic. Your whole cat, your whole ensemble really is just like amazing from, from head to toe. Can you kind of talk about um, assembling that cast? I mean, starting with, you know, getting Bruce Dern to play Jo. I mean, did you, did you say like, you're not gonna talk much but you're going to scare the crap out of everyone. No, I mean, I was worried because, you know, we, you wanted, I mean, the guy's just in a wheelchair, so I wanted someone that, that brought with them, you know, the, the baggage of being that, you know, a, a strong-willed, intimidating person, and, and Bruce was very high on my list, and I really didn't think that 
he would do it. I got an inkling from agents that like no older actor would want to play a sort of palsied wheelchair victim and with two lines, you know. <laughs> and um, when I spoke to Bruce, he said, um, um, Johnny and my agent said, you know, Bruce, you don't want to do this. It's, you know, there's only, you only got five words in the whole film. And I said, fuck you, that's five words too many. I'll do, I'll, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna play it with my eyes. <laughs> I just love Bruce. He was yeah. just fantastic to work with. <laughs> And you mentioned you'd worked with his daughter, Laura, before. Laura, yeah. Yeah. yeah and we don't live here anymore. She's awesome. I mean, was he terrifying on set? Did he stay in character or? No, Bruce, he's a, he's a lovely man. He's full of stories and... Great stories. And, and, and he's very generous. He, I mean, he just loves to be there. He's, a, he's, he's one of those things we're talking... I was talking to a few actors the other day about he's an acting animal. I mean, he's an animal for it. It's like blood in the water. He wants to be there. He wants to share it and give it and, and do it and experience it. And, um, and uh, you know, it, it's something that he, you know, is innate in him. And it, it'll, it'll go until he can't do it anymore. He's wonderful. I also like that you cast Ed Helms and Jim Gaffigan, who are really known for their comedic work, um, sort of against type. I mean, was that, do you sort of enjoy casting people against type? Or did you just really see them in these parts? Well, it's, you know, when I read the script, it occurred to me, you know, in the story, when you research it, I mean, it's sort of a tragedy that turns into a farce, you know, yeah. and, and the script had a lot of black comedy to it. And, you know, there's a lot of great dramatic actors that aren't that funny. I mean, I'm sure Jason knows a few of them. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I found the comedians, you know, comedians are really tortured, complex, yep. you know, it's so true. sad people a lot of times, and they can draw from a lot of different, a different aspects of their life you know they got a well of stuff to draw from but they also know they've got that ability they just have that that they know the, the comic pause or you know they can improvise lines and you, you know there's just so much more fun you can have when you got to draw comedic moments out of them and Ed's you know um, I was I had a very specific type for Joey Gargan he's really the moral compass of the film and you know, I wanted him to be played by someone you believe was a lawyer and, and was intelligent and whatnot. And, and Ed just, when I, I just sat with him for like an hour when I met him and I just like, this is the guy. And Jim was like a wild card. I, I couldn't find, Paul Markham was a very specific body type and I wanted that with Joey Gargan and I, and I, I just was having trouble finding it. And, um, and I saw a clip of Jim and I just thought, wow, it'd be really great I'm gonna meet him, see what if he'd be interested. And then I talked to Ed, and Ed, by coincidence, is very good friends with Jim. Really? So I, that sort of nailed it for me. And um, they were great together. They were a lot of fun. They're both from that angry comedy, sad club. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Jason, I'm sorry, I don't keep, I mean, mean to keep harping on the fact that I wouldn't have thought of you to play Ted Kennedy, but it's just so stunning to me because <laughs> from the moment we see you on screen, you look and sound like this guy. How long did it take to, I mean, I think we've all probably experimented with the Kennedy voice, you know? <laughs> um, how long did it take you to find that voice? And did you have like a, 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 a dialect coach? Yeah, yeah, I work with a guy called Tim Monick, who is a very, within the acting community, is a very hard sought after brilliant man he's really he's amazing um yeah, yeah it's you know it's, it's a lot of work it's it's like going to the gym if i don't if i don't do the work literally starting out you know one hour a day two hour days up to six you know when you get to ready for production six hours a day of just literally just drilling it you know to get those muscles so that they can function and then just finding that tone i mean you know you can get tapes of actually of caricature versions of the mm -hmm. Kennedy. back in the 60s there was a a recording of the a group of comedians did a caricature version of the Kennedy White House. And even that was very helpful to go over the top a little bit to bring it back. You know, tone was important. The pitch that they have is really important. His pitch is different to the pitch in my voice. Um, you know, and then John said, listen, we've got to do the teeth. We've got to have the smile. You know, my, my smile is I have, I have small teeth, you know, and a very, you know, I didn't, you know, my, I didn't have braces when I was a kid, so they're not straight. You know, I don't know the Ted, but he, you know, he had a very particular smile, and, and so we, we spent a lot of time uh, teeth having teeth made. Thing. I didn't yeah. even realize you were wearing teeth. Yeah, the I'm teeth. Staring. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, <laughs> there's a very thin. I mean, they have to be super thin, or my tongue can't operate with them, and they have to fit very, very precisely because any, you know, like any small rub after speaking for 15 hours a day on set, you know, will we'll turn into, you know, 
the, the biggest bleed and gash and, you know, I mean, hole in you. Mm. Like the smallest little rub. It, 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 it took a long time for us to get that right. You know, we made them too long, then they were too short, because they had to fit for my mouth, but it looked like Ted's. And we had a couple of plumpers in there. Yeah, the first pair were really over the top. They looked like yeah. a horse. <laughs> like, you know, it was a bit too big. Yeah. Would you have to stay in the accent all day? Because it's got to be hard to go uh, back and forth. Yeah, it depends on how tired I was. You know, it literally, it, it's a fine line to, you know, you don't want to run out of gas. You have to be able to do it at a pinch, but you don't want to. Um, you know, sometimes if I feel like I'm, I need to get up to speed on a, on a shoot, I will do it a bit more and stay in it a little bit. Um, maybe to make other people comfortable, other actors aware of where I'm coming from and what they're going to hear. And then sometimes you just go, you know what, I, I need a break, it's a bit too much. What did end up being like the most difficult part of the shoot, either from a logistical point of view? I mean, just, I don't know what the budget of the film was, but I know it was an independent movie, and I have a feeling it looks a lot more expensive than it was. Um, the, the most expensive thing really was that w when I first talked to the producers, you know, it was that old thing of, oh, there's a really good incentive in Toronto, let's shoot there. And I was like, I've been to Toronto, there's not, Toronto does not look like, you know, Martha's Vineyard or the Cape, and, um, and I didn't want to do that. And, and so, you know, planning our flag, shooting it in Boston, you know, the North Shore, and I wanted to shoot in Chappaquiddick. You know, I wanted the, the real bridge and the real dike house in there in the film. I just thought it would, you know, the ghost of that would, would be great. Um, that had its own inherent cost to it. You know, um, there's an incentive in Massachusetts, but you know, um, bringing principles in and, and all the other things that 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 made it very tight. You know, like it, it it reduced my days making that decision, but it was very important because you know when you shoot in these. And wherever you're going to shoot, you know, you're drawing like 80% of your cast from local people, and a lot of them aren't actors. And I wanted, I didn't want a bunch of people in Toronto doing fake <laughs> Boston accents, and that would have been a disaster, you know. Some so like it's, it was obvious to me, you know, that I, we're going to shoot there, and I'm going to find authentic, you know, Cape type people and characters and accents. And you know, Martha's Vineyard back in the 60s isn't, isn't the Martha's Vineyard it is now. Mm -hmm. Now it's like a high-end resort. Back then it was like a real, you know, low-end, bohemian, you know, um, pretty pretty rough. You want to look at Martha's Vineyard and see what it looked like around the time of Chappaquiddick watched Jaws, because it's all shot in really? Rainbow Town. And, yeah, we shot in the same, well, not the same ferry, but the second generation of that ferry that they shot on there. Um, but you can see that, like, that's what it looked like back then. It doesn't look like that now, you know. But it was very, you know, that made it, you know, more costly. So that was the most difficult thing, is like as a macro thing with the shoot. Um, and then, you know, during the water work and the accident, we built that, we rebuilt the bridge uh, to the exact specs of the bridge in 69 down in a tank in uh, Mexico, you know. Um, so, you know, those things, chew in, you know, what happens is you just, you're, you, you make those decisions and then you have less days to shoot. So we were cramming like a 40 day shoot, 45 days shoot into, you know, 30, 32 days, I think. You shot yeah. in 32 days? Yeah. Wow. That's and what you get. I mean, that's a luxury. It used to be, that's what it is now. <laughs> <laughs> and Jason, for you, was it a difficult shoot? I mean, I don't know if you're the kind of actor who takes your work home with you, but did you find it hard to leave Ted Kennedy behind at the end of the day? Yeah, it was, a, you know, I mean, it's, 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 you know, that first night is a long, you know, that first night of the day, it was like a... It was a long few weeks that just was one day. Um, you know, and there was, John and I had one very, very tough day where I did run into a wall when we shot that, that telephone sequence, you know, in Chief Arena's office. You know, Ted's got you know, 20 minutes, I think, to, you know, to resolve a lot in his mind and also physically. And um, John wanted a lot. I mean, I wanted a lot, but... Um, you know, that was a very brutal day, and that was, that was the hardest day, actually. I really did run into a wall of, like, I'm going to do something very bad or wrong, <laughs> or I'm going to, you know, and then, and then John walked up, and he did, he walked up to me when I, I was out of my mind. I really was out of my mind at the end of the day. It was a very long day. And John said, you know what, go home, we don't have it, we're going to do it again tomorrow. And I was... And I took it home that night. You know, I mean, I was, you know, it was, yeah. And that, but you know, that was, that's what we were after. We, we, we you know. We, there's we always a scene, it. like, there's always a scene or two that, that you read this, everyone puts so much importance on mm -hmm. them. You know, that this is the, the emotional scene of the film. 
and they're always fucked. You shoot them, and it, like they, they, for some reason, I mean, this is my experience is that people put so much weight on them that, you know, sometimes you come at it too hard, and then you just like, you just have to. Yeah, but there was a lot in that as well. It was, you know, yeah, Ted, there is. Ted's relationship with guilt and pain, you know, and loss and grievance and all that is very complicated. He's been through a lot, this man. And, um, and what I think, you know, that, you know, that crazy day and, and a bit of the next day, it was, was a very distorted way of, you know, you, know, you, you always watch Ted go through it and it's not what you think or predict. But, you know, if you do a bit of research on, you know, think about what he's been through and, and stuff, you know, you go, well, actually, I can see how that makes, makes sense. Well, that's what I see now. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I remember reading a couple of, you know, there was a couple of pictures that John had from Life magazine that was taken just before the accident and Ted was a very, you know, it was like a winter shot in a cardigan up in Hyannisport before the accident, you know, and he was a very distant man. You could see he was in, the, in crises almost. You know, and then there was another description of him in the hospital when Bobby died, you know, and, and one of the guys was talking about how he'd never seen such grief in a man. He just, just catching Ted and, and little things like that. And I, when I look back at that scene, I think, you know, it was good to really, you know, really mess that around or mess my head around and, and come up with something quite strange as well as painful and, and you know, being able to think through what's going through the man's mind. Uh, finally, I'm just curious, do you guys have any theories as to, you know, the, the enduring appeal of the Kennedys, why we're still so fascinated by this story and this family all these years later? Mm, I don't know why we're so fascinated by the Kardashians. So I don't, I mean, I don't, I mean, I, who knows? I mean, I, I think that certainly in the 60s, I mean, I, I come from uh, eight kids, big Irish Catholic family. The Kennedys were sort of like growing up my generation. They were, you know, our version of a royal family, I guess. They were attractive and um, charismatic, telegenic. I mean, all the things that, that um, you know, now we kind of come to expect almost as part of the as a necessary facet of, of politicians in some way, I guess. But, you know, they were, they were sort of a romantic ideal, you know, and for my, my generation. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, if you consider Ted, you know, his, Joe dies in the war, John's assassinated, Bobby's assassinated, he's the last brother, you know, and it's 69. And, you know, this is a guy that by the time the late six, after Bobby was shot, I mean, you, you read a lot about Ted in that period after Bobby, and he was a mess. Mm-hmm. I mean, people worried for his sanity. Meanwhile, all of America wanted him to, to run and, Bobby's place, and he didn't, and you know, and that set off a whole chain of events. I mean, the riots in '68. A lot of it was because we got stuck with Humphrey, and you know, everyone knew he was going to lose to Nixon, and you know, there goes the anti-war protest, and you know, but they're aiming for '72, and and it's and this is a guy that doesn't even really want to be president. You know, you, in his words, you know, at that time, and even looking back on his life, it just wasn't in him, and all that pressure on him, I think. Um, in some way, like this story for me is almost like cosmic fate, you know, playing its hand that, um, you know, it made sure after, I mean, after Chappaquiddick, there was no way he was going to be president, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, So, and I think that kind of capped the end of that, that aura of the Kennedys, but it, it still lingered, but it sort of lingered in sort of subsequent tragedies, you know, they just kept every couple of years, there was another Kennedy tragedy, you know, but, um, you know, Ted did endure, and I think um, maybe the, it was the Catholic part of him that, um, you know, all he could accomplish was what he could accomplish as a senator, you know, and, and I, you know, he probably accomplished more than any other senator in history. You know, he was like, passed like 2,000 laws that he sponsored and, you know, was, a, was you know, had his hand in some amazing pieces of legislation. Um, and whether that redeemed him, I don't know, you know, that's for everyone to judge, but, mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah, I think that there was a period of the Kennedys, but I, I think it was then, you know. What he did, you know, I mean, would he have done that if it was his mother? You know, but then, as you said, if you go, then I, you know, the first thing I did was then go look at his record of this man. You go, well, he's, he's done all of this as well, but does that make it better? As John said, well, you know, um, uh, even Joe Kennedy, you know, I mean, he wrote the SEC laws, you know, the, uh, this Bobby's speeches are some of the best writing and, and speech work you'll, you'll see anywhere, whether you believe the rhetoric or not. It's still beautiful, soaring words. Really amazing. So I think it's, it, it's going to go on and it rightly should go on, you know, for a long, long time. As you, know, as you examine 
what the truth and the reality of it. He was the, you know, Jack was the first Catholic president. You know, people believed that a Catholic, you know, was going to take his orders from the Pope. It's absurd. It's like the world was round, you know, it was flat. So, I, you know, I think there's a lot rightfully there to look into. And I, you know, I sort of think it's going to keep continuing. But you need to look at things honestly, particularly with our political heroes, because it's just way too much not to. Thank you guys for being a great audience. And thank you guys thank for being you. here.